I remember yelling fire. A house goes up in flames with a family trapped inside. I was going to do everything in my power to help save the other girls. And then the circle maker, Mark Batterson, reveals the power of one simple word. Plus. Hi, I'm Marco Rubio here in Iowa, the heartland of America. I'm here with David Brody. Watch my story on The 700 Club. Well, he is fixated on climate change as imperiling the planet. And along the way, a couple of weeks ago, he said, however, we have contained ISIS. But his own top military advisor says, not so, Mr. Prez. Now the United States is having to send more special operations forces to battle those Islamic killers. And it looks like they'll be fighting alongside our friends, the Kurds. That move comes as a new study shows that the radical Islamic ideology of ISIS is getting stronger on the Internet, including right here in the United States. Caitlin Burke has the story. It's being called a belated step forward. The new group of special operations forces headed to Iraq will conduct raids, free hostages, gather intel, and go after top Islamic State targets. When they go to bed at night, who's going to be coming in the window? The United States uh, 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 is, and I think must, uh, lead in this fight, but we need others to go with us. Defense Secretary Ash Carter said the U.S. forces would likely be mixed in with Kurdish fighters who are already battling ISIS. He didn't offer up the number of U.S. soldiers that would be deployed. Through our own action and those of our coalition partners, the military campaign will destroy ISIL's leadership and forces, deprive it of resources and safe haven and mobility. All the while, we seek to identify and then enable motivated local forces on the ground to expel ISIL from its territory, hold and govern it, and ensure that victory sticks. The move comes as the nation's top military officer directly contradicted remarks made by President Obama last month when he said the U.S. has contained ISIS. Let me ask you this. Declared we, have we currently contained ISIL? Uh, we have not contained ISIL. Have temporarily. they been contained at any time since 2010? Uh, tactically, uh, in areas they have been, uh, strategically, they have spread since 2010. And while ISIS is gaining territory in the Middle East, it's also gaining support internationally, including right here in America. A new study by George Washington University says several thousand Americans regularly consume Islamic State propaganda. American ISIS supporters are predominantly active online. Twitter is the platform of choice, but ISIS supporters are using other social media as well. Just another sign of the growing danger from this radical Islamist movement. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Folks, they can be destroyed very, very easily. You know, I heard the other day, it just makes me sick. We sent an air sortie to bomb oil depots that were controlled by ISIS where they get great sums of money. But when we got close to them, somebody in the White House said, do you realize that'll hurt the environment mm -hmm. if we blow up those oil tanks? So the mission was scrubbed and the jets were brought back to their base mm -hmm. because we want, don't want to hurt the environment and we don't want to offend any civilians in the area and we don't want to make anybody in the Arab world mad at us and we don't want to call it like it is because that might upset somebody. And the political correct people in the colleges will be upset if we say we're at war. And so we play these silly games. In the meantime, our enemies are gaining. But the polls across this nation have shown that Americans don't approve the president's handling of ISIS. And polls in another country show the people there don't believe the president has their best interest at heart. George Thomas has that story. Thanks, Pat. The Iran nuclear deal earlier this year was just another example to Israelis that President Obama has not been supportive of the Jewish state. In fact, more than half believe he has been the worst president for Israel in decades. Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Jerusalem. It's no secret the relationship between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu has been one of the most strained in the history of U.S.-Israel relations. 
Former Israeli Ambassador Michael Oren says the Iranian nuclear deal adds a new layer of frost to an already cold relationship. The issue will be how can the United States help Israel uh, grapple with the greatly enhanced dangers that have been created by the deal. Oren points to Israel's northern border to cite a major example of that enhanced danger. Hezbollah terrorists in Lebanon receive a billion dollars from Iran each year. With the one billion dollars a year, Hezbollah has purchased 150,000 rockets, all pointed at us. This year, Iran's going to get 150 billion dollars in sanctions relief. That number over the next coming years is going to go up to about 700 billion dollars. So how many rockets will Hezbollah be able to buy with two billion dollars, three billion dollars, ten billion dollars? Oren says Israel should go on the offensive against Iran. We need not only to defend ourselves against Iran, we need to deter Iran. In part because of the Iranian nuclear deal, Israeli opinions of President Obama are at historic lows. More than 60 percent consider him the worst U.S. president for Israel in the past 30 years. And nearly 80 percent believe the Iranian nuclear deal puts Israel in danger. We found those views reflected on the streets of Jerusalem. He's uh, abating, you know, with the other countries, Iran and Iraq, and treating them like allies rather than Israel. I think that people feel very insecure because of Obama. I don't think he, it seems like he's very ignorant as to the position he takes on, uh, with respect to Iran. I think he's the most anti-Israel president since Jimmy Carter. I'm very happy that his term is ending, and I'm hoping that the next president will be pro-Israel. Oren came to Washington as ambassador, then watched an international friendship turn sour, and wrote about his experiences in the book Ally. He still believes, regardless of the strain, that U.S.-Israel relations are crucial to the stability of the region and the world. We are the barometer, we're the litmus. And if, uh, if America's other allies in the world look in, at America's relations with Israel and see a strain there, they will have a moment of uh, sort of questioning America's commitments to its allies worldwide. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Here at home, scientists are taking on a major new debate. Should the human genetic code be edited? A new technology tool makes it easy to precisely edit genes inside living cells, like computer software. Scientists are developing treatments for diseases like muscular dystrophy, sickle cell disease, cancer, and HIV. But the question is, what could be the impact if those, in, those treatments are eventually used on human genes? Those genetic, uh, genetic changes could spread down to future generations with unknown consequences. And some experts warn it could open the door to designer babies and could change future societies if ways, in ways we cannot foresee. Applebee's and International House of Pancakes are dropping soft drinks from children's menus, but parents will still be able to order sodas for their kids if they want to. A spokesman for the group that owns both chains told ABC they believe parents are in the best position to decide what the appropriate food and beverage choices are for their children. The restaurants have milk, chocolate milk and hot chocolate for kids and IHOP will feature juice starting next spring. McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's and Dairy Queens have already made similar changes to their menus. Sugary drinks, of course, have been associated with various health problems like obesity, diabetes and more. Pat, do you think this is a good idea? I think it's a wonderful idea and I congratulate Applebee's. They are amazingly forward looking. I mean, the. The redesign of their restaurants is just extraordinary. I mean, beautiful decoration, and uh, uh, they have all kinds of creative menus, and every time you turn around, they've got a new one coming out, and so, do you ever eat it? They do. They, they do have a lot of great salads yeah. and a lot of you know, heart-healthy stuff on the menu, so good for them. They have very good little, little sirloin steaks that they serve. They mm. make good baked potatoes. Their vegetables are good, but that's nice. You know, these soft drinks are the pits. A friend of mine started what was called a Happy Meal out in Kansas City that spread throughout the, uh, I guess, what is McDonald's chain that has Happy Meals. But um, that thing is, is toxic. You know, those mm -hmm. drinks are toxic. So uh, the, 
I don't know, the soft drink companies, they've had a free ride for a long, long time, and I think they're beginning to feel the heat, but, uh, well, they should, because this stuff is not good for you. It's really not, Pat. All right. All right. Well, coming up, the son of Cuban immigrants who's living the American dream, and now he wants to become your president. I believe, with all due respect, that I give our party the best chance to win this election. David Brody talks with White House hopeful Marco Rubio after this. Well, the poll rankings, Donald Trump was still leading the pack. He may be getting the attention in this presidential race, but other candidates are slowly moving up to the front runner status. And one is a senator, a young senator from Florida named Marco Rubio, who's making a strong pitch for evangelicals, specifically in Iowa. Our David Brody spent some time with Rubio in the Hawkeye State as he delivered his gospel message. So far in this presidential campaign, Marco Rubio's best moments have come on the debate stage. For the life of me, I don't know why we have stigmatized vocational education. Welders make more money than philosophers. We need more welders and less philosophers. Combine those moments with a pro-America personal story on the campaign trail. This is not just the nation I was born in. This is the country that literally changed the history of my family. My parents were not born into a rich family. They were both born into poor families on the island of Cuba. And you have a candidate on the rise. Behind the scenes, Democrats say they would rather not take him on in the general election. Word on the street, inside the Hillary Clinton campaign, they are very worried about you. Should they be worried? Well, I think if I'm the nominee, we're going to beat her. And that's one of the reasons why I chose to run for president. I, I believe, with all due respect, that I give our party the best chance to win this election. With all due respect, he has a crowded field to pass, especially in Iowa, where voters get first crack. Ted Cruz, Ben Carson, Donald Trump, they're all doing well here. And Rubio knows he'll need to score with the crucial evangelical audience in the Hawkeye State. Florida Senator Marco Rubio. Thanksgiving week, CBN News gained exclusive access inside a private meeting with Rubio and about 100 pastors in both Cedar Rapids and Des Moines. The gathering was sponsored by the influential American Renewal Project, which works to get pastors politically engaged. To ignore our Judeo-Christian values is to ignore the founding of our country and the principles that allowed this country to become great. This nation was founded on the belief that every person has uh, natural rights that come from their creator. And that's where we get free enterprise, that's where we get our republic. If you don't have a creator, then what is the source of your rights? Uh, the government, the law? Inside the room, Rubio took the opportunity to tell pastors more about himself, like his short-lived college football career. About a year into my career there, I realized that I was destined for the National Football League, except for my lack of size, speed, and talent. He also spoke on issues near and dear to his evangelical audience. Today we have a president that treats Israel with less respect than what he gives the Ayatollah in Iran. And of course, radical Islam. If you want me to bring it to, to home, they believe that one day the state of Iowa will be governed, or what today is known as the state of Iowa, will be governed by Islamic law as they interpret it. Rubio expanded on the religious nature of the conflict in our interview. The reason why the religion part of it is important is because that is what motivates them. You have to understand what it is that is motivating someone to take action. Usually it is a geopolitical desire or a nationalistic desire. In the case of radical Islam, they are motivated by their interpretation of their faith, which they believe obligates them to kill anyone who does not accept their teachings. Rubio also addressed a growing fear inside our country, the threat to religious liberty rights under the Constitution. Religious liberty? It's not just the right to believe anything you want. Religious liberty is the right to live and exercise your faith in every aspect of your life. And with social issues and moral values under attack, he believes pastors need to play a crucial role. There's a lot of pastors and others in churches I've run into have become concerned about speaking truth on some of these issues because they don't want people to be offended in the pulpit, because they don't want to scare or drive people away. They want, you know, people want to hear happy talk sometimes when they, when they show up to church. But I think those that are in the pulpit have an obligation to preach truth. And those in the pulpit also wanted to know about Rubio's spiritual truth. Tell us about your experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, using that name. 
That opening gave Rubio a chance to explain how attending an evangelical church with his wife brought his Roman Catholic faith alive. I didn't learn about the Catholic Church until I went to a non-Catholic church and became infused in the Bible and became infused in the written word of God. And, in, and then and only then did the liturgy of the church start even making sense. And then we heard candidate Rubio morph into Pastor Rubio. As far as my relationship with Jesus Christ, the best way I've been able to describe it to people that are not believers is God became a man, came down to earth and died for our sins. He provided the ultimate sacrifice because up to that point we lived under the law. And the law meant that we had to sacrifice an unblemished lamb to cover our sins, not erase them. God was the ultimate sacrifice. It was his own son. That satisfied the pastor who asked the question. I wanted to know his relationship with Jesus Christ. And boy, he had a good answer, didn't he? Mm -hmm. We're pulling pretty strong for Marco Rubio right now. Um, not completely there, but boy, tonight sure was a game changer. But it wasn't an easy win. One pastor challenged him on receiving support from rich Republican donor Paul Singer, who aggressively supports same-sex marriage. How do I know that he's not going to direct you? He's not going to sway a large amount of influence over you? When someone cooperates with my campaign, they are buying into my agenda. I am not buying into their agenda. And that has been very clear in my, in my history. That seemed to do the trick. I think my favorite line was when he said, when a donor gives money to me, they buy into me, I don't buy into them. I think that was well put. Rubio sees this as just the beginning of his relationship with evangelicals. Hurdles will still remain, such as questions about why he teamed up with Democrats on immigration reform. But for now, Rubio is making new evangelical friends and getting prayed up in the process. We claim the favor and wisdom and power of the mighty one to be upon you now. David Brody, CBN News in Des Moines, Iowa. My, 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 it's getting close. <laughs> we have shown you John Kasich, we've shown you Jeb Bush, we've shown you uh, Marco Rubio, I think Ted Cruz has been on with us, and uh, uh, we haven't had the Donald, and i got to get him on here. To, I, I, I think we'll set up an interview. He, 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 he wants to go anywhere that he can make a splash, and so he and I have been friends for a long, long time. I first met the Donald at Trump Plaza up there in uh, Jersey City uh, when there was a heavyweight prize fight with Evander Holyfield, and uh, I went back in the dressing room and prayed with Evander before the fight, and then I talked to Donald after that. And yeah, anyhow, Marva, Marva Maples was his current girlfriend in those days. And, uh, Did Evander win? Oh, yeah. yeah he won. <laughs> See, you got to get back to pray for you. <laughs> got to do something. I can't guarantee that every time I pray for somebody in a heavyweight fight, they, they win. But anyhow, uh, they'll be closer to the Lord when I get through. <laughs> right. Amen. Right. Well, coming up, a family gets a literal wake up call courtesy of their smoke alarms. And I opened the door and it was just heat and black. It was the moment where I didn't know if it was God's will for us to live or to die. See how they miraculously made it out alive when we come back. Well, you may not know it if you've been listening to the PC crowd, but Christmas is not a four letter word. So this year, we wanna encourage you to bring light to a culture that wants to remove Christ from Christmas. If you're a CBN partner, look for this envelope in the mail. Inside, you'll find your very own Christmas cling that you can stick on the window of your car. Looks just like this, very nice. And if you're not a CBN partner, we'll send you a, this sticker absolutely free of charge. You can just call the number on your screen, 1-800-759-0700, or log on to CBN.com. And let's do our part to make this a very Merry Christmas. Thousands of people in cars going all over the United States saying Merry Christmas, regardless of what the PC crowd. You know, that's, right. that's really a, a beautiful thing. It really is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice you can have in your car, or your house, or your place of business. So if somebody comes into your store and other things on the, the window, and um, it'll be nice. Something we can do to, well, share the joy of the Lord this Christmas. Just a few months ago, Aaron Weekly and his family were at their picture perfect home overlooking the Blue Ridge Mountains. They were getting ready to head out on a nice vacation. 
And that night, they left their home for the very last time. Watch this. Things were great. The girls were doing well in sports. Health was great. We had just finished our kitchen. We modeled it and just, we were so proud of it. <laughs> Little did I know that God was preparing us for the trial of a lifetime. Coming up soon is our wedding anniversary, 18 years, and we have three daughters. Cassie is our oldest, Allie is our middle daughter, and then our youngest daughter is Emily. Me and the girls decided to eat outside, um, and I had asked Allie to go and light um, a citronella candle. Didn't think it was gonna even last the whole dinner, but it, it did. I had worked late, it was about 10.30, I believe, before I'd gotten home, and about 11 o'clock I went to bed. I just remember waking up and hearing the smoke alarms. I couldn't figure out why the smoke alarms would be going off. And I opened the door and it was just heat and black. And I remember yelling fire. The smoke was so thick you could not see six inches in front of you. And the first thing I thought of was my girls were dead. It was the moment where I didn't know if it was God's will for us to live or to die. Our bedroom was kind of on the end of the house. As I ran by our youngest daughter, Emily's bedroom, she came out um, right at about the same time Amy was coming through. Took her hand, we walked out the back door. And I can just remember thinking I was gonna do everything in my power to help save the other girls. Since the fire started outside on the porch, the smoke alarms hadn't gone off until um, the flames had breached the, the wall, really. Uh, so the front of the house was totally engulfed at that point. I immediately knew I had to go upstairs and get our other two daughters. Couldn't see anything. The smell was just horrific. Um, you could taste it. I heard my middle daughter, Allie, yell, and I, I told her to come to the steps. And once she got close enough, I could see her, and I reached down and grabbed her left forearm, and I could hear Cassie, our oldest daughter, on the other end of the upstairs, um, screaming. And I yelled for her, Cassie, you gotta come to the steps. You gotta come to the steps. And uh, she was just panicked. And uh, I was running out of air, and, and I knew Allie was running out of air, so I took her down the steps, um, back through the house and out the back door. Got a breath, yelled for Cassie. I'll never forget looking up and seeing she was standing there in a window screaming, um, somebody help me, I, I don't wanna die. I'm, I'm gonna die. Should I tell her to jump? It's 30 feet, there's pavement and two vehicles parked underneath of her. And I said, Cassie, you gotta go back to the steps. I knew we had to get Cassie. I can remember going up the steps. It was so dark, I couldn't even see the steps. And I can just remember praying, God, please help me find Cassie. We couldn't see each other, we couldn't hear each other. And when I got to the very top of the steps, it was as if God put that kid's hand in mine. Just praying, God, please help us not to fall, because if we fall, we won't make it out. And it was as if God made a ramp that morning and angels carried us out because her nor I remember one step coming down. All I can remember is grabbing that kid's hand and us walking out that back door. Did we see angels? No, but did we feel them around us? every second. All I knew is that God had saved us and I just knew he wasn't through with us yet. And as I stood in the back yard and Amy came up to me and she was black from head to toe. All I could see was the whites of her eyes. She grabbed my arms and she said, it's okay, we're all out. There was literally nothing left but a side wall in the basement. But every room in that house, every picture, Every memory of the girls playing baby dolls, you know, all of the um, little kitchen sets that we had saved for their children when they grow up was gone, which seemed like in the blink of an eye. I remember crying as I watched the house burn. It's that moment where you feel everything stripped from you. When God's Word says that He will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding, that's exactly what I felt. And in that moment, I, I remember thinking about that passage from Lamentations. Um, great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. There was no doubt in any of our minds that he had ordained every step um, through that house that morning. Um, he had totally protected us from the flames. We were taken to the local hospital and I'd spoken to Cassie, I'd seen her, she was talking, she couldn't open her eyes. I didn't know that her corneas had been damaged that badly. Well, that's where they told us, hey, Mr. Weekly, we're gonna airlift your daughter to UVA. Then I began to get concerned for her. She was on all kinds of feeding tubes and oxygen and, and, and wires hooked up to everything because they said she was literally black from the top of her throat to the bottom of her lungs. And he said, Aaron, I've seen over 6,000 burns. Your daughter's burns were the top three inhalation burns I've ever seen and the other two didn't survive. 
They thought she was gonna have to have a trach and that was devastating for her. It was hard as a mother to see your kid like that um, and to see her spirits go from being positive to being very discouraged was just heart-wrenching. I said, God's using you, kid. He's using you for a reason. You've got to stay positive and you've got to believe that he loves you and that he's going to take care of you. The awesome thing is we have such an incredible community, an incredible church family, and that there were so many people coming over and praying with us. And we knew that there were literally thousands of people praying for Cassie. People had started GoFundMe site and, and it was just, we were so blown away by the response. We had left the hospital and gone to the mall to get some clothes, you know, obviously because we had nothing. The lady comes up as Amy's getting ready to check out and she said, hey, a customer overheard your story and wanted to give you this and handed her a gift card for $150 for the store that we were in. We're nobody special. Um, the outpouring of love from the community, we saw it as God's love working through people. And it was just a glimpse of His splendor. It was like God saying, I got this. Every need, every need, I'm here to supply it for you. Cassie today has gone through a couple surgeries. Um, she does have her trach out now. Her voice is um, above a whisper. It is extremely raspy. She had to go in just this past week to do another um, surgery. It was the first time the doctor really got to give us good news about her vocal cords. In fact, his words were, praise the Lord, the surgery's working. Through all this, God's definitely been faithful because look how far he's brought me. I mean, they didn't even think I should have survived this whole thing, and here I am today. I understand why we had the fire. He has brought so many people into our lives. A man that we definitely know has gotten saved through all this, which is worth more than any of our belongings. So many people ask God why, you know, that his soul for, was for, worth far more important than any house or any possession we've ever had. And it's such an awesome thing for us to know that God used that. He used our trial to save a soul. We just want people to look at us and see God's faithfulness and God's love and God's mercy and God's provision. For us going through this fire, um, we couldn't have done it without God. I don't know how anyone goes through a trial without God, because He is your hope and your strength. God will hold your hand every step of the way. Well, the Bible says God works all things together for good to them that love the Lord. Uh, and He will work everything together for you. And I tell you, the weekly family had every reason to curse God, every reason to complain, every reason. Why did it happen to us? What a testimony of overcoming faith. God bless them. They're a testimony to everybody. So listen, it's time to pray. We want to pray for you and your needs. Uh, but here's somebody named Annie who lived in Lake Wales, Florida. She suffered for years with a foot fungus. It looked like chicken pox, and she used a specialized ointment. It didn't do any good. One day she was watching this program, and Wendy, you said somebody with a fungus problem in your feet. God's touching you now, and he's going to get cleared up. Annie looked down at her feet <laughs> right then, right then, and the rash was completely gone instantly. <laughs> Praise God. I remember that day. Do I remember you? getting that word. Yeah. yeah I thought, okay. You, but you didn't know Annie. I sure didn't. That's All right, you got, you got one oh, more. Yeah. Then. Sorry, here we go. Carol right. of Westerly, Rhode Island, was experiencing a, a terrible neck pain. She was unable to turn to the right side while driving. Well, one day, Carol was watching the 700 Club when she heard Pat say, you stretched your neck muscles. It's not whiplash, though. And she claimed that word, and the next day, the pain was gone. Carol is praising God for this he healing miracle. Um. We have a God, when you think of God, He's above all the earth, He's above all the stars, He's above all the galaxies. And this earth is a tiny fly speck in the midst of a huge universe. And we're creatures on this little fly speck, and yet He loves us. But for Him to fix the thing that's wrong with you, it's no problem. For Him to give you money, it's no problem. God is able to do all things. With him, nothing is impossible. Now, he said, if you guys come together, two of you, and you agree on something, 
it will be done for them by my Father, which is in heaven. That's what Jesus said. So Wendy's here, and I'm here, and we're going to join hands together, and we're going to believe God for you. So if you'll pray with us, nothing is impossible. Amen. Father, I join with my dear sister in Christ. In the name of Jesus, we come against spiritual forces of the darkness that's come into somebody's life. A cloud has come into your life. Darkness has come into your life. We rebuke the darkness. Satan, in the name of Jesus, we bind your power and the forces of evil. Mm. Yes, a lot of people being attacked in their minds right now by tormenting spirits, as Pat just said, and spirits of confusion. Just lift your hands, start praising God, and those spirits are going to leave in Jesus' name. Somebody else on a burn hoard, and, and you know, burns are the most awful things that happen to people. And you've, you saw the testimony of that girl, yes. and you said, God, how about me? And God says, yes, I heard your cry in the name of Jesus. Mm. The power of God is reaching out to you right now, and you are going to be completely healed. Your flesh will be as clean and whole as a baby's in the name of Jesus. Yeah, there's somebody with, um, you strained your back, Thank and you it's just really painful, very hard to move. And uh, uh, you're just crying out to God right now to relieve this pain. And he's heard your cries. Just start praising him. The pain's leaving now in Jesus' name. And Lord, as we come close to Christmas, we pray uh, for those that are suffering around the world. We think of those who are homeless, those who don't have enough food to eat, those who are, uh, don't have clean water, all these things. Help us to help them and bring forth deliverance to the captives that they may be set free. In the name of Jesus, Jesus. do miracles. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hey, it's almost, it's how, long, how far are we away from Christmas now? 23 days. 23, 23 days. days. <laughs> yes. That is just over three weeks. All right, we're <laughs> almost there. Well, anyway, we've got all these pretty trees around us and decorations and everything. You know, I was in Pittsburgh for Thanksgiving. That's yeah. I usually go up yeah. there for Thanksgiving. And I just want you to know that I met, I believe, my number one fan, a 10-year-old girl <laughs> yeah. named Annabelle, who's best friends with my niece, my 10 year old uh -huh. niece, Sydney. So I just got to say hi to Annabelle and Sydney because they love the 700 Club. They're Pat. watching that. She's 10 years old. She watches every day with her mom. God bless her. Okay. <laughs> well, They're going to love that. All right. We'll Lord. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What's that? We'll still ahead. It's only two letters and it can be used to bemoan the past or open a future of possibilities. So what are they? Best selling author Mark Batterson tells us when we return. Oh, that's And welcome back to the 700 Club. Ahmed Mohammed, known as Clock Boy, says he wants to go back home to Texas. Mohammed and his family are currently living in the Islamic country of Qatar. In an interview with CBS 11 in Dallas, Ahmed said he wants to go back to where people knew him growing up. But he says his family held off for now because of a peaceful protest with guns outside the mosque they attended in Texas. Muhammad was arrested earlier this year when he brought a homemade clock to school that was mistaken for a bomb. His family has demanded $15 million in a lawsuit. A federal judge has ruled that a high school and a parent can remain anonymous as they sue over a live nativity scene that's part of the annual Christmas show in a school district in northern Indiana. The American Civil Liberties Union and the Freedom From Religion Foundation filed a lawsuit in early October. They argue that the nativity scene endorses religion in a public school. The father and son don't want to be named because they're worried about intimidation. The judge has yet to rule on the request to stop the nativity performance, which is scheduled for December 11th and 12th. As always, you can get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Groovy Christmas music there. Well, have you ever said something like, if I had, if I just made that phone call, or what if I had taken that job, or if I had only tried harder? You're not alone. We've all had these if moments. And as Mark Batterson explains, that one little if changes everything. Take a look. So here's the question. 
What's your what if? What is your one God idea? What's your God-sized dream or your God-ordained passion? God is ordering your footsteps. He's preparing good works in advance. And the God who began a good work in you, He will carry it to completion. Our only regrets at the end of our lives will be the time, the talent, and the treasure that we left on the table. I'm convinced of this. When everything is said and done, all that matters is hearing God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Mark Batterson is here with us now, and he's the author of the new book, If. Mark, welcome back to the 700 Thank Club. Thank you God so you. much. It's... Appreciate it. All right. Now, recently you wrote about your own if moment that culminated with a ride to the top of the Eiffel Tower? Yeah. <laughs> this has got this has got to be good. <laughs> well, you know, one of my life goals was to kiss my wife on top of the Eiffel Tower oh, and yeah, and, and uh, it happened and and I start the book there just talking about how if Eiffel had not built that tower, <laughs> uh, I certainly would have would not have accomplished my goal and so just have a little bit of fun with how uh, my ifs affect other people's ifs and their ifs affect oh. other people's ifs. And so uh, history is kind of this intricately interwoven series of ifs, if you will. So you did it. I did. Okay. Yeah. You take an elevator to the top or you yeah, can't you we, climb it? We, we climbed the, to the second, the second floor and then took the elevator to the top. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Well, I have my own kissing story about the Eiffel Tower, but that, but we're interviewing you. We've been interviewing right. you. Well, that sounds right. Yeah, I kept looking at the monitor thinking, are we going to see a picture? Did you take pictures? Uh, my daughter took a picture for us. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we, we need to get that. All right. Well, you write that there are 1,700 different ifs in the Bible. It's a lot of ifs. And you focus on one you call a game changer from Romans chapter 8. What is that? Yeah. yeah. Well, I love all the ifs, and most of the, them are on the front end of God's promise. So, you know, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Or if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. But I love Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against oh, us? I, I, I believe that God is for us every day in every way. He proved it at the cross. And yet there are a lot of people that somehow think God is against them. And so then they posture themselves against God. But uh, this book is really about um, outlining this idea that God is for us. That's amen. Well, you say that if happens in three forms. Okay, here we go. As if. Um, what if, and uh, what was the other one? If only. If only, thank yeah. you. All right, well, let's start with if only. What do yeah. you mean by that? Well, I think we all have if only regrets, um, mistakes that we made or things in our past that we wish we could change. But uh, the good news is that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So it's Romans 8, 1, and the chapter begins there. And so uh, God doesn't just forgive our sin. He also wants to leverage those regrets for his purposes. And so uh, until you deal with some of those regrets, it's hard to get to what if. And so the book starts there. It really is because you don't feel like you're worthy. You feel like you've just messed up, that that's never going to happen now. And you don't even go there anymore. So you've got to go back to the basics. I'm forgiven. God's for me, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and the good news is, is that God then leverages them. I mean, I, I've found that I'm most able to help people where I've been hurt or where I've made mistakes. And so, absolutely. you know, God wants to redeem those and recycle those. And I think that's good news. He's, that's how good he is. I love what it says on the back of your book. All that stands between you and your wildest dreams is one little if. Well, you proved that with the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Uh, yeah. um, that's powerful because we all have dreams, yeah. you know, and just one little if. Um, let me ask you this. How do you get rid of an if only regret? Well, I think it starts in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that he, he's the one who pays the penalty for our sin. And, and that's the heart of the gospel, that he, he pays the price for our sin and we get his righteousness. And, <laughs> and that's why it's called good news. And so we don't have to live in regret. Um, our past mistakes don't define us anymore. We're defined by what Christ accomplished 
on the cross. All right. Well, other than, you know, what a teenager says when they kind of roll their eyes as if um, you have a different <laughs> definition for, for as if. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's faith. Uh, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. Um, I, I live by this little uh, motto, Wendy, that, that you work as if it depends on you and pray as if it depends on God. Mm. And so um, to, to me, you can, you can let your circumstances be, come between you and God, or by faith, you can put God between you and your circumstances. So faith is really not defined by the reality that we can see and, and feel and touch around us. It's defined by the promises of God. It's living as if. Amen. Well, you talk about the anchoring effect. What do you mean by the anchoring effect? Well, y your focus determines your reality. And so what are we going to anchor ourselves to? I think the answer are these promises of God, yeah. uh, most of which have the little if in front of them. And th the good news is no matter how many promises God has made, there are yes in Christ. Yeah. And so in my experience, you just have to stand on the promises of God. And sometimes you just have to white knuckle them, Wendy. You have yeah. to just hold on to those promises and let those promises define your reality. And I think that's the people who see the miracles, the ones that just hold on and don't give up, you know? Well, the last if is uh, what if, you know, what if, what is it? What is what if? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. And so what if is uh, allowing uh, who God is to begin to invade the reality of our life. Uh, A.W. Tozer said, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And I guess the question I would ask is, is he a big God? Mm. Is he bigger than your problems? Is he bigger than the circumstances that you find yourself in? Uh, I believe in a God uh, who is who is high and exalted in a God who exists outside of the four space time dimensions that we live in. Uh, I believe in a God who is uh, wonderful counselor, mighty yeah. God, Prince of Peace, <laughs> and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the God that I believe in. Well, Mark, you might not know this, but my first year at CBN, I lived in DC and you were my pastor. No, yeah, I went to your church. And you dropped this on me now. Uh, yeah, right now, on the, <laughs> live on the 700 Club. I just I thought, I just want you to know that it, you were a blessing. I was only there for a year and then they brought me down here. But you were an awesome preacher and, oh. and, and look how God, 17 years later, oh. high five, God <laughs> bless you. Thanks for getting me started. Thank you. You know, but uh, you're a great, great preacher and a great author. And you can get more great insights from Mark Batterson if you get this book. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We had to do it. It's available in stores nationwide. And again, it's called If Trading Your If Only Regrets for God's What If Possibilities. What a great gift for someone for the new year as they begin a, a new beginning. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being with us. And, thank you. and God bless you. And thanks for being my pastor way yeah, back when. I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, Pat, back to you. Very intriguing cover and a great concept. Mark, good, good work. Well, still ahead. Time for your email questions. Here's one from Marina who says, quote, I think my 18-year-old son is addicted to porn. What can I do to help him? Hear that answer and more when we return. It's the true spirit of Christmas. Hear the sounds of comfort and joy on CBN's Christmas Radio. Visit CBNRadio.com to listen now. India, India. Millions of people still have, don't have access to what we take for granted, clean drinking water. And for one woman, the search for water almost turned deadly. Pori feared walking to the open well to get water because poisonous snakes were always nearby. One time I was bitten by a snake while getting water. My family thought I was going to die. One of the villagers told the pastor what happened and he came to my house and prayed for me. After I prayed, the Lord Jesus Christ healed her. She completely recovered. That's when my husband and I put our trust in Jesus as the one true God. But Pori still had to keep going to the well. 
even though the water she risked her life for was almost as dangerous as the snakes. It is filled with garbage, dirt and bugs. Drinking that water often made my husband and me sick. When we were sick, we couldn't work. That meant we couldn't eat. They knew Jesus could do miracles, so they asked him for help. We prayed that he would solve our water problem. And soon, CBN came to our village and dug a well. All the villagers rejoiced knowing they could easily and safely get clean water from CBN's well. The well is close to our home. Now we don't have to walk far or be afraid of snakes while getting water. Now we will not get sick from dirty water and we will have more time to work. We thank God and CBN for making this possible. I ask and I'll give you living water. Jesus Christ, out of the abundance of any of your men or men will flow rivers of living water. We can do that. And folks, isn't it great that you can reach all the way around to India, village suffering, scared of going out with poisonous snakes. They've got to get the water. The water is fetid and ugly. It makes them sick, but they have to have something to drink. And so they go there and these snakes bite them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine living in a situation like that? Well, the way that we can enjoy Christmas, the way we can enjoy God's blessing if we share with others. And then it's happiness. It's much more blessed to give and receive. So we're asking you, help us help the world, help the people around the world, those at home that are suffering. Uh, you can dial in 1-800-759-0700. Say, I want to be a 700 Club member. And we have a gift we want to give you. It's called a Transforming Word. Words of uh, uh, overcoming, uh, to overcome fear and experience peace. My peace I give to you, not like the world gives. I'm going to give you my peace. And we'll give you these uh, when you join the 700 Club. Okay, we've got some questions. Got some interesting questions. Very okay. interesting. <laughs> All right, Marina All right. writes, my 16-year-old son is looking at porn. I think he's addicted. What do I do? How can I help him? I really don't want to tell my husband because they don't have a good relationship. My husband hardly speaks to our son and he even gossips about his own son to others. I don't want my husband to tell people about this. I don't go to church. I feel so alone. Please help. You know, I don't think anybody who's not one understands the enormous influence that pornography has on a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old boy. I said he was 18. He's actually he's 16. 16. 16. Yes, yeah, 16. Okay. The addiction is very strong. So he's got to be with some professional counselor. He also needs to get into a relationship where uh, they're boys and girls where they're in a healthy relationship, you know, a fellowship group where they're all together. And um, he needs to get his mind off that stuff. And the only way you can do it is to get him exposed to it. Beyond that, y you've got to deny him access to the, to the uh, web. You give him something else, but he just can't sit there with a computer in a darkened room. He shuts the door, locks the door, hits the... The, the, the on switch and the next thing you know, all these images come in front of him. You've got to get him, get him out of that. I mean, you have to take action. He's still in your home. He's still your son. He's still a minor. And he's still got to do what you tell him to do. But get him. You've got to get out of the house. Get to a church group where they've got a healthy, like Young Life, for example. They've got some really keen kids. Young life. See what you can find. Okay. All right. Carrie says, my husband and I have a 26-year-old daughter who lives with us along with her two boys. She is not married, and the father of the boys is homeless and uses her transportation, phone, money for gas, etc. There has been some domestic violence, which she says she's forgiven him for and says we should too. We are always in conflict in how to address this situation as there is always drama and uh, continuing situations. Is there anything we can do? Well, uh, what you're doing now is enabling a very difficult situation. She's m m living with that guy. She's not married to him, apparently. Uh, now they're separated. Uh, but he's a freeloader. He's a bum, and he's taking advantage of her and taking her money. Uh, I don't know what to do in a situation. You've got to reach out, and she needs a male figure in her life. And you're a single woman. 
and you need to get her to places where wholesome environment exists. And if you have to, go out and ask. There are men's groups and churches and so forth. Ask for some of them. They, they, they need some help, women and men, to help your daughter and to explain to her the, the mistakes of her life. But the one thing you can't do, they're grown children, you can't live their life for them. You, just, you might as well get used to it, but you can pray and ask the Lord to do something. All right, one last question. Yeah, Gina says, when out and about, how do I start a conversation about God with people I don't know? I really want others to know the Lord, but I don't know how to share. Are there scriptures I should share with them? Well, the, the Bible says that uh, uh, people can be one without a word by your godly conduct. And I think what they want to see is, uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The way you live, the fact that you're kind, the fact that you're, you're not grieved, that you're not all shook up, that something bad happens and you, you're, you're able to overcome it. And people will say, what is it you've got? Then you begin to tell them about John 3.16, uh, for God so loved the world. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Matthew 21. And all things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Thanks so much for being with us. And uh, for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. You